You're watching the Spirit Food Christian Center Worldwide Webcast, broadcasting live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Yes, amen, hallelujah. When Spirit Food comes to you, blessings will flow. Say yes. Repeat these words after me. I'm holding in my hand that which I'm holding in my heart, the holy written word of God. The Bible is God speaking to me. I am what the Word of God says I am. I can do what the Word of God says I can do. I have what the Word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. Therefore, God's Word is being confirmed in my life with signs following in jesus name amen hallelujah and amen to god be the glory you may be seated youth you are released to your classes the teens those that are going to go we're going to have the word of god in such a wonderful way explained unto us Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. All of our young people are blessed and encouraged. They're going to be receiving from their instructors the anointed living word of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Today is Resurrection Sunday. It is a day in which people acknowledge all over the world the acknowledgement that Jesus Christ hung on the cross, that he died according to the scriptures because he was crucified. And his body was buried in the grave. And on the third day, he arose from the dead, alive and well. Now we're going to be receiving instruction about what is it about the resurrection? What does the word resurrection mean? Well, I'm a person who likes to study foundational words. I like to think about where did that word come from and what's the purpose of that word? And how did it develop? Well, resurrection. Res, or when a person has a reservation for something, that means there's a place for it. It means it's an actual opportunity to show up. Resurrection, erection, refers to standing up. If I say to a person, come and stand at attention, and they stand like this, that won't work because their responsibility is to stand erectly. And when they stand erectly, they're showing by their stance that they are at attention. It's very important to look at a posture of a person. I think one of the things that presidents and leaders of states and heads of nations have all gone through, even ambassadors in their training, they had to learn proper posture. You can't just walk when you're there person who lead in the nation, you can't walk like that. They tell you, you got to walk like this. And why do you have to walk erectly? Because you're in charge. The person who's in charge has to stand erectly. A posture of an individual says a lot. When the police stop people who are perpetrators of a crime or suspicious and they tell that person, we want you to lay on the ground, stick out your hands, and go face down. Why do they need the person to lay down? The posture of the individual says a lot. If, if you've ever, 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 ever seen any of the cop movies or shows, usually you'll see that when the police tell a person, all right, put your hands up. That's a posture, too. That's a posture of surrender. 
They'll tell them to get on their knees. That's a posture of surrender. And then they'll tell them, lay on the floor with your, or the ground with your hands outstretched. That's a posture of surrender. The posture is telling a story. That means that you're under submission to authority. When we talk about posture, that is important because all of us who are in Christ Jesus, when we say resurrection, that means I'm going to arise and I'm going to be in a resurrected position or an erect position. That means my Lord and my Savior, who is the resurrection and the life, he's not laying in a grave anywhere. He's actually alive and well. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Turn your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 2. And we're going to look here in Hebrews chapter 2. And we'll start at verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2. Well, I've got to read up a little bit further just for context sake. All right. Um, <laughs> I'll start at verse 1. <laughs> and if I, I'm going to end up in Genesis, I'll tell you that right now. Okay. All right. Let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Everybody should have your Bible. Say, I have my Bible. All right. Verse 1 says this, Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection in the world to come, wherefore, uh, whereof we speak. I'll read verse 5 again. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak? But one in a certain place testified, saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, you may be wondering, why am I taking so long to read? I'm doing it for a purpose. I'm going to explain some things, but I've got a foundation here in writing that lets you know that we're going to be talking about death. But when we talk about death, we're going to be talking about it in the way God wants us to understand. Because the word resurrection has reference to to erect, to come forth from a position to erection or standing up, being in authority. For verse 10 says, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation, perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. 
them is referring to all of us who believe on him, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself have suffered being tempted he is able to succor, that means to support or bless them that are tempted. He succor means he's able to strengthen you. He's able to bring you up and cause you to live in his victory. Now turn over in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Now, you remember what we read in Hebrews that it says, for as much then Jesus Christ, that as he, then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. One might ask the question, well, why did he, Jesus then, why did he have to die? because he became a man. And man was condemned to death by Adam's transgression. Now man was not made to die. Man was not supposed to die. Man was supposed to live and be what he was created to be, and that is he's supposed to be God's representative in the earth realm as God's children. God made man to rule. God made man to stand erectly. When I say man, man, woman, we were created to stand erectly, which means that we're to rule and reign in this life. But now Satan sees what's going on, and remember, Satan is an angel. And he turned his back on God. And not just turned his back on God, he was created to carry out the will of God, which is to to minister for them who are heirs of salvation. He supposed, angels were created to minister and carry out the bidding of God's children. But we have an angel that the Bible acknowledges that says, ah, oh, no, no, no. Rather than angels doing the service for man, this particular angel, Satan says, I'm going to run man and not let man run me. Now, how is it that he came to do that? Well, Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall from heaven as lightning. And where did he fall from? From heaven, then where would he go to? To earth. And where in earth did he go to? He hit earth so fast, Jesus said, he was like lightning. So now, when God created Adam and Eve, when God made them and then fashioned their body from the dust of the earth, Adam and Eve are walking around in the earth realm as God's representative or God's on the earth. Satan sees what's going on. He's like, no, no, he don't want to have that. And so what he did by getting Eve beguiled, which means that he, he got her to agree with him out of confusion and not understanding what his whole purpose really was about. But Adam knew exactly what was going on. But Adam said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to live without my wife. If my wife goes, I go. Because Adam had already said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And Adam said that without having a mother, God was his father, but why would he say, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. 
Well, Adam, when he said that, Satan was in the earth realm and he heard it. And Satan says, the best way, the only way I'm going to be able to run this planet is I'm going to have to run it with Adam's authority. And, and I got to get Adam to be separate from his father. That's why he came in to the garden to cause Adam to come against God himself, his father. Now, Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Bible says that Adam certainly knew what he was doing, and he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when he did that, he was already told ahead of time, and Eve knew this as well, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now, when you think of a person dying, what do you think of? When you see a person that's dead, what do you think of? You think of a person laying down, don't you? That's usually what I think of. Usually when people are buried, I've done lots and lots of memorials over many years. I haven't seen anybody buried standing up. I've always seen caskets go in the grave down. Or I've always seen things that pertain to people's body being returned to dust. And dust lays down. It doesn't like have the shape of standing up. And here's the thing about it. In Genesis chapter 3, we'll notice turn over and look at this. You're there in Genesis chapter 3, right? All right, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. Now, we do have a recognition that the word serpent is used there, but I want you to think about this. This time, when God is speaking, referring to or showing us what the devil is talking and saying to Eve, the devil is not laying down on the ground. He's actually erect. And, and there are or science programs that I love to watch and so forth, and they were talking about, you know what? It looks like at one time snakes had the capacity to be erect. So the devil, when he's talking, he's not wrapped around the tree. He's erect, even though he's a snake. A snake. It's necessary that you remember this. It says here, verse 5, for God doth know, the devil's talking, that the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now, remember, man was made to stand erect. Is that correct? All right, so he's walking along, but yet he's trying to hide from God, he and his wife. They got fig leaves outfits on, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that's what they did. And then we go on further, it says in verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree which I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. See how he just passed that right on? She, the Eve is a pro, Eve. Okay, God said, <laughs> that's your answer? <laughs> verse 13, Genesis chapter 3, verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go. And when God said, Upon thy belly shalt thou go, when God said that, the erect serpent, who is now operating under Adam's authority, right, is lying down. He has to lie down when God said it. On your belly. Now, why did he say on your belly? Remember we went over at the beginning, we talked about a 
posture of a person makes a difference. I would hope that we never ever see police officers lying on the ground with their hands stretched out. You never want to be in a situation like that. Never. Why? Because that means whoever caused them to lay down is the one calling the shots. So what's going on here? The devil was walking around as a serpent, but, but he's walking around with Adam's authority because of Adam's transgression. Adam allowed for death to come into the earth realm, and the death came into the earth realm by his sin. Sin means to miss the mark. And so God didn't come to Adam and just start barking out instructions to him. No, God said, Adam, what happened? Then he went to Eve. Eve, what happened? And then he went to the devil and notice, he didn't say, God didn't say what happened. God just started telling the devil what was going to happen to him. Why? Because you never ask a liar a question. Did you hear what I said? Why? If you ask a liar a question, what's going to be your response from the liar? A lie. So Jesus said, the thief, thief, <laughs> only comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have life more abundantly. So what goes on is God doesn't ask the devil a question. God speaks to the devil and says, own your belly. Now, does that sound like an authoritative position to say on your belly? And notice in verse, we're looking here at uh, in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, let's see here. Mm, verse 13, uh, 14, verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And then God goes on to say something else. Verse 15, and I will put enmity, which means deep-seated hatred, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now somebody says, that sounds like a punishment. Well, actually, God is establishing their way to exist in a world that has now been subjected to sin through Adam's, through Adam's transgression. And Adam's transgression not only allowed for sin to be observed throughout the world, even though it was just Adam and Eve and the devil that God was talking to at this time. But God is explaining the borders, or I should say it this way, the boundaries of what is now going to take place. And God wants his children to be aware of what's going on. Because remember, God is still in authority. That's the reason why he told the devil, on your belly. See, God is still God, even though Adam and Eve messed up. I'll say that again. God is still God, even though Adam and Eve messed up. For in the chapter 2 of Genesis, the Bible says, In the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. In the original language, it reads this way when God said that to Adam. In the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. It reads this way. In dying spiritually, you'll die physically. And dying spiritually, that means, Adam, if you eat, or if, when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you are going to be separated from the life and the nature of God. And that will culminate in you physically dying. And when we said, posture matters, when a person dies, what happens to their posture? I'll say that again. When a person dies, what happens to their posture? They lay down. They're not what? They're not erect. They what? They lay down. Now, the reason we're talking about laying down versus standing up is because resurrection, the word itself, means what? To come erect. To be there and standing erectly, which implies you are the one in charge. So why are we talking about the word resurrection so much? Because through Adam's transgression, death passed upon 
all mankind. Not just mankind, but there are timetables of life for everything now. Trees have a lifetime. Animals have a lifespan. Dogs and birds have a lifespan. Everything has a lifespan. Why do you say lifespan? Because death ran the show through Adam's transgression. So when death runs the show, and death was not running the show, when God made Adam and Eve, the way it started out was Adam was a living soul. We don't know how old Adam was when he sinned against God. Why? Because death didn't play any part of it. Are y'all with me? So now when death came on the scene, the, the, the knowledge of death causes everything to what? Lay down. Who rules? Death rules. That's why when we talk about the resurrection, we're talking about a very serious subject here because to be raised up from the dead means that death has no more rulership over you. And when you start talking about death has no more rulership over you, that bothers the devil because the devil wants a perfectly engineered person by God to have eternal existence on the devil's program. That's what the devil's really after. Now, Adam was told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was a tree of life that would make it possible for man, for man to come from an innocent state, an innocent state. You know what I mean by innocent? Innocent means, hmm, I'm just doing what I'm doing. I'm not aware of anything being, you know, violated because I'm not doing anything. But when Adam sinned, the knowledge of sin and death is embedded in him now. And there is what? How do you know that sin and death is in him? Because when God's voice came walking in the garden, what did Adam do? I had to hide myself. Now there's something else going on with man. What is that? Shame. And when man is shamed through the knowledge of sin and death, man is aware. Hey, you know what? Hey, 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 hey. Uh, sin has got man, as it were, by the throat. And man is aware that the devil is running things. And when the devil is running things, what's the devil's mode of operation? To kill, to steal, and to what? And to destroy. So what is death? What? Well, I gave you the answer to the question. When is the war of 1812 fought in 1812? Okay, so what is the devil really about? Death. 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 The devil's like, hey, I run this show. And, and what I say goes on. And if somebody doesn't line up with what I say do, then what does the devil pull out? The death card. What did the devil try to do when Jesus had fasted? And he said, he saw, he said, Jesus, turn these rocks into bread if you're the son of God. He was letting him know, Jesus, I'll tell you when to eat. Jesus said, no, man lives by bread alone. Man lives not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil said to him, oh, well, see, I, I see you quoting scripture. So the devil says, um, hey, I want you to go to the top of the temple and throw yourself down. Now, why would the devil try to get Jesus to throw himself down? And he quoted scripture, too. The devil quoted Psalms 91. He'll give his angels charge over you lest you fall and dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus says, what? You're not to tempt the Lord your God. And what I'm going at is this. The enemy was trying to, if he couldn't get Jesus to make his sustenance or food by being obedient to the devil, and Jesus was not going to go the way of the devil, then the devil said, well, I got to get you to kill yourself. Because remember, the only thing the devil can actually do back then before the resurrection is death reigned, reigned means had the ascendancy from Adam to Moses. Now why from Adam to Moses? Because Moses came forth with the Ten Commandments and he showed by the Ten Commandments, look, if you follow these instructions, 
you'll find that you, you'll be protected. And if you're protected, you won't accidentally slip over in the death and death just can't take you because God said he'll take sickness away from the midst of you and the number of your days you will fulfill. Now you're still going to die because the timetable was given to you through Adam's transgression. But, but you're just not going to just be taken out kicking and screaming because the devil just wants to take you kicking and screaming. If you obey these commandments, you'll be able to say you lived a full life. Am I making sense to you? It's kind of like a chain, a, a chain. I remember when I was in the Boy Scouts, or Cub Scouts, and we went on a tall uh, mountain trail. And I was looking over the side and I said, man, there's nothing here to block me from falling over and dying. And I was kind of like, whoa, let me not get to the edge, too, too close to the edge of this thing. There's nothing to stop me. I'm used to, as a little kid, I'm used to having barriers, things to protect me. No barrier. Better not get too close to the edge. Why? If you slip off, that's on you. And so that's the way it was from Adam to the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments operated as an iron or a chain, whereby if you get too close, at least you can say, oh, I know not to get any further than this. Am I making sense to y'all? Okay, now go back over to Genesis 3. This is going to make sense more and more sense or revelation light as we study this because we're talking about resurrection the resurrection the ability to come forth and be erect verse 17 of Genesis 3 and unto Adam he said because thou hast hearkened to the, the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I command thee saying thou shalt not eat of it cursed is the ground for thy sake and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. When you hear about thorns, what do you think about Jesus in the crucifixion? A crown of thorns on his head. Verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for thus thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now, the question, did she really, did she really actually live after she died? No, she died spiritually, but in her spiritual death, it didn't mean that she ceased to exist. It just seems that it, it says that she stopped being innocent before God. She's aware that she's blown it. Adam is aware that he blew it, and because of that, there is lodged within man a separation from the life and the nature of God. So man knows that God exists, but man no longer has an understanding of God because he's cut off from the light source of God. All right? Now, since he's cut off from the life source of God, then what happens to the body? The body ends up laying down dead one day. Why? Because it's like taking flowers. And you ever see that people love to have flowers, bouquets of flowers? But once you cut it off from its life source, what happens to the bouquet of flowers? It's a timetable, right? It may not look like it's dead when you hand it to the person you love, but in reality, they're dead and they're dying. It's just that you haven't seen the fullness of it yet. So Adam and Eve are what? They're like the flower that the Bible describes of man's life. When they sinned against God, the life source is cut off. And what's going to eventually happen? Man's body is going to lay down in the grave because the body without the spirit is going to die or lay down. Now read on further in verse 20. And Adam called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So that means God changed out their wardrobe, took the fig leaf suits that they were wearing and got rid of those and gave them skins. Now, why did he give them skins? Because the skin says that the animal that God took the skins from, the animal was going to die. And what animal was that that was going to die? The, the, the lambs were the animal that God took the skins from. Now, it's necessary that Adam and Eve see that God, who is still God, God is going to cover them. Now, they're in a situation they can't get out of. 
They're in a situation where they're cut off from the life and the nature of God. How do you hide from God? You can't hide from God. God knows where you are. But they were aware God still exists. They heard his voice in the, in walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So, yeah, they know God exists. They're trying to hide from his presence. They got something to try to cover themselves. But God comes forth and shows how he's still the redeeming God. The redeeming God, the loving God, the reconciling God sees his children in their situation, but he already made a provision for them to live the eternal life that he had for them at the beginning. Now, they're no longer innocent. They're no longer innocent. And there's a difference between innocence and perfect. When you're innocent, you don't have a knowledge of sin. When you're innocent, you're just, oh, um, I'm doing my thing. But let's say you're driving a car down the road and, and you're just driving down innocent. But if you see a posted sign that says the speed limit is 25 miles an hour and you look down at your speedometer and you're doing 40, now you have the knowledge of what? Breaking the law. And so the Ten Commandments gave the knowledge of what the speed limit is for life. Before then, it's just man's what? Innocent. Now, what's going on? Here's what happens. Verse 21. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now, everybody note this. The tree of life is different than the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is exactly what it says. The knowledge of good and evil you're going to have intimate acquaintance with. Tree of knowledge of good and evil. So all men all over the world, all over the world, all over the world, through Adam's transgression, we all have knowledge of what? Good and evil. I'll say that again. We all have knowledge of what? Good and evil. Now, why is that important? Because when you go to any country in the world, you'll notice that there is a, a legal system. There is a legal system. And the legal system says there are laws and there has to be a, an ability to go to court because man has the knowledge of good and evil. You don't have to be uh, born in a particular legal family in order to be a juror on a case. They don't even ask you if you're a Christian when you can become a juror. Why? Because everybody, everybody has the knowledge of good and evil within them. Everybody. Now that says this. If a person tells me, well, you know, I heard about the Ten Commandments. I understand that. But the Ten Commandments, I've obeyed them. If you ever hear anybody who tells you that they've never broken the Ten Commandments, I want you to know that person is what? Come on, everybody. If a person says, I know the Ten Commandments, I've never broken the Ten Commandments. If they tell you they've never broken it, what are they doing? Lying. They're lying when they say that. Everybody has broken the Ten Commandments, but everybody can also agree that the Ten Commandments are good, just, holy, except man can't keep it. <laughs> That's it. Although, even the judge that sits on the bench, I'm sure broke some laws. But the judge has the what? Authority to preside over the case. So when we talk about the judge, we're talking about authority. Now, authority is delegated responsibility. Authority means that you are in a position to make judgment even if you're not perfect. You still have to have what? An enforcement of something that will be better for everybody. So, judge, you may be aware you were speeding going to work that day, but you're going to give some people some problems that were speeding because you, oh judge, what? That's the cloak you wear. That's the authority you wear. Okay, now let's read on further. We're looking at Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now this is what, this is a huge statement. Verse 23, Therefore, 
the Lord God sent him from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, which is angels, and a flame, a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. All right, what's that, what does that mean? That means as much as Satan did when Adam and Eve sinned against God, Remember, they weren't perfect when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were what? Innocent. They weren't perfect. Now, perfect means this. You can't get any better. Perfect means you are at the apex. There is no room for growth. You can't improve because perfect means it is. That's it. That's it. Un done, done. Adam and Eve, they weren't perfect when they ate. They were innocent. After they ate, they were what? Sinners, but they were what? They were still non-perfect sinners. Which means they weren't going to live for eternity being totally at one with the devil and never capable of dying. Another death. So when God kicked them out of the garden, God then did that knowing that Adam and Eve were told they had a covering of skin. They, the Eve was told, uh, I'm going to bring forth the seed of a woman, and the seed of the woman, his heel would be bruised, but he's going to squash the devil's head. So Eve got an insight. You know what? The devil used me to mess up, but God's going to use a woman to bring the cleanup. And Adam was aware, I messed up, but God in his love and mercy is going to do what? He's going to cover me up until he brings forth eternal life. And, now, and man can be perfect. Man can be perfectly redeemed by God. But that is going to happen by believing God, not by what? Not by man's good behavior, because man now has the heart of the devil. So now let's explain. Jesus goes to trial. And if any, if any of you have ever been over to Israel, you know that we've seen the, the, the opportunity to, to walk through what the Bible describes happened with Jesus. We've seen the place where he was crucified in Golgotha. We saw the chambers where he was inter interrogated. We saw, a, where, uh, we saw Herod's palace and so forth. We, we, we saw a lot of stuff while we were over there. We even went in the empty tomb, my wife and I, and I saw the tomb where his body had laid and the stone that was rolled over it, but it was backed away but yet you could, we could walk into the tomb. So the stuff that the Bible records is not a what? It's not a fanciful story. It's a record of history. And that's just really important because Jesus said, destroy this temple and after three days, I'm going to raise it to, I'm going to raise it to life. And, they, and, and the people that hated Jesus said, hey, you know, we remember that this, this malefactor or this deceiver said, if you kill him in three days, he's coming up out of the grave. So Herod said what? I mean, Pilate said, go ahead and make the, temple, the, uh, the, the grave as sure as you can. But the only thing about it was this. God can't be beat. God is still God. Say it again. God is what? God is still God. Now, since God is God, nothing is impossible with God. Since nothing is impossible with God, Adam, he, he brought sin into the world and death by sin. And man, all of mankind deals with the subject of death because of what Adam did. Before Adam's sin, we weren't even talking about death. Death wasn't even an issue. But after Adam's transgression, Death was an issue, and people began to think about death in this manner. Oh, I'm scared to death. I'm scared to death. Oh, death. Oh, no. Don't talk about death. Some people, their whole lives change when they talk about a memorial, or when they go to a memorial. Ah, oh, they trip up. And then Jesus comes along, and he tells a woman that was bent over. Remember, posture means the difference, makes a difference. A woman was going to church like this. She was in the synagogue like this, and Jesus touched her and said, you're loose. And she, he, he didn't say it's Jesus' name. He did it. He is Jesus. And the woman stood up straight, and that upset some people. Why? Because the devil is like, if I got to crawl on the ground, everybody else got to get down. And Jesus straightened up a woman. 
Jesus goes to Lazarus' tomb. Lazarus was dead four days. And the Bible says, they said to him, Jesus, but now he stinks. He stinks. In other words, death, death, death got a hold of him. Death, death, death is the end. Jesus said, Father, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you always hear me. And I'm talking now for their ability to hear what I'm saying. Lord, thank you. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. And what happened? The man that was dead came up out of the grave. And then the people that didn't like Jesus, that were listening to the devil, said, we're plotting the plan to kill Jesus, and we got to kill what? His miracle man, Lazarus, too. Why? Because anybody that can come along and just vanquish death or cause death not to be the final word, that person is going to get some attention. And then they said, we're going to crucify Jesus. And so they crucified Jesus. Now, the Bible says this. If, if the devil had known this, if the princes of the world had known this, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Why? Because when they hung him on the cross, the Bible says, the person that hangs on the cross, cursed is every one that hangeth on the tree. By him hanging on the tree, he became accursed. Jesus took our sin upon himself. Jesus took our disease upon himself. He took our transgressions upon himself. And the Bible says that upon the cross, he said, at the, one of the things he said was, it is finished, tell, tell, side. That means it's over and done with. I've satisfied what is necessary. What is necessary, Jesus? Remember the rule of thumb. The wages of sin is death. You clock in on the devil's time clock, you're going to get paid. Adam clocked in and all of mankind had to pay the price. The only person that could pay off that debt would be somebody who was just like Adam that was a full-fledged man that had innocent blood and had the capacity to make the decision without the devil lording over him. And the only person that could fit that bill was Jesus who was born of a virgin because his blood came from God, but yet he's a man, a full-fledged man. His body got tired. His body was hungry, but yet he's what? He's God in the flesh, but as he operated, he operated as a man, a Jewish man, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the office of a prophet. So when he died, he died a full-fledged man. So when he said it is finished, that means stamp, that is paid, mankind that was brought under subjection to death through Adam's transgression. Now mankind has the opportunity to live. And he can live, but what kind of life is this man now supposed to live? He's going to live what's called a resurrection life. Now resurrection life is different. Because even though Jesus' body laid in the grave dead, God, by the power of the Holy Ghost, raised up Jesus' body. And when he raised up Jesus' body, he can't die anymore. But it was a trip to the disciples because they're like, wait a minute, we saw him die. We knew the spirit got into his side. Water and blood came out. We know he hung his head and said it is finished. We know he died. We know he died, died. It wasn't no question about a crown of thorns on his head, hands pierced, his feet were pierced. We know the man died, died. I died, died, was dead. That's right. But resurrection means to be erected again. Now this brings on a whole new story because humanity now has something available to them that did not exist before Jesus did this. That's why when Mary and Martha said, we know that our brother Lazarus, he'll come back to life in the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. See, he made it clear. Don't try to act like this is a religious traditional thing. This is reality. Adam brought sin. Jesus brought eternal life. And the eternal life begins when you believe and obey and say, God, I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Because what happens is 
You become born again. You become a new creature inside of you. How do you explain it to other people? Don't really know how to say it other than what the Bible says. But that which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. I don't know how to tell you. I look the same on the outside, but on the inside, something happened. How many of you have received Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Raise your hand. Did you change on the inside? I said, did you change on the inside? Yes. All right, if you didn't change on the inside, you ain't born again, even though you, okay. All right, now here's what happened. The power of God that made you identified now with Christ. For if Christ be in you, you have a hope of glory. You have the life of God inside of you. How powerful is that life? It's powerful enough to change this body that will one day lay down in the grave or when Jesus returns, this body won't have to go to the grave, but it can't go to heaven the way it is because it's tainted by sin. So the body will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the trump of God. So that's why I'm walking around all happy and, and thrilled because what? I've got resurrection power on the inside of me. When the devil says, well, see, you used to do all this dirt, and you used to do that. I'm like, but I have the life of God on the inside of me. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead has made me alive and well. So in my heart, I have the power of God. So fornication, I don't have to do it. Lying, I don't have to do it. Stealing, I don't have to do it. Smoking, I don't have to do it. I don't have to blow my brains out with all kind of craziness. Why? Because the life of God is in me. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So the devil says, uh-oh. Uh-oh. The devil is saying, uh-oh. Because he's got a problem. Death has no more dominion over us. We're not afraid of death anymore because Jesus vanquished it. And we, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. The devil can't manipulate us and say, you're in bondage to sin. No, if I'm dead in Christ Jesus and I'm now raised to life in Christ Jesus, and death will not have any, or sin shall not have dominion over me. I live in a body that's faulty. But I have what? The ownership of Christ on the inside and, my, and the power that raised Jesus from the dead. If it can bring Jesus back from the dead, it can certainly work through this body that I'm told to offer unto God as a living sacrifice. So when we talk about resurrection, some people say, well, let's just talk about eggs and let's talk about Easter lilies and all. No, I want you to think about this. Live the resurrection life. Live like Christ dwells on the inside of you. You have the hope of glory, and therefore, you're not afraid of death. The subject of death doesn't freak you out. Why? Because you've got the victory over death, hell, and the grave in Christ Jesus. And them that have passed away in the Lord, they're with Christ. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So what is the devil going to do with you? Nothing, except get tortured by us. Now you're to rule and to reign in life by one Christ Jesus, your Lord. It's really important. Not running around in the earth talking about, well, I can't wait till I get to heaven. Lord, something may happen, but until then, oh Lord, keep the devil off of me. God says, you are my children. You overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. What is your testimony? I believe in Jesus. Then because you believe in Jesus and you have accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Somebody said, well, if, I'm God, if I got God living on the inside of me, why didn't my lifestyle change? It changes when your thinking changes. You got to get your mind renewed to what you are and who you are in Christ. And the more you find out about who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ, then you become a really, you are a problem. You are a problem for the devil. You are a problem. 
He can't ruin your marriage. He can't ruin your kids. He can't ruin your finances. He can't ruin your health. He can't ruin anything because what? Christ in me, the hope of glory. Whoo, what a powerful statement. I want to thank you for tuning in today's lesson. If you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then I'm going to lead you into a confession of faith. If you say these words after me, you can become a child of the living God. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let us pray these words now, believing these words in our heart and saying them with our mouth. Dear God, I believe in my heart you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. He was crucified. His blood was shed to wash me clean. And dear God, you raised him from the dead. So I confess with my mouth now, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. You are alive. I believe this in my heart. And because I confess you as my Lord, I am now a child of the living God. Father, thank you for making me your very own. I will live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to thank you for your continual support of this broadcast of Spirit Food Christian Center. We're so grateful for your participation. I'd like to give you an opportunity to participate by our Push Pay app. Text MySFCC to the number 77977. You'll receive further instruction on how to give. We're so grateful and thankful for your continual support and love. Remember, you're helping to make it happen. In Jesus' name, you amen. Are the sun.